behind every good picture is an even better story. So I'd like you guys to picture this. Imagine a beautiful Seder table with all the delicacies and of course that terrible crane. And if you start to look at the people there, so you see each person is like a, a walking story, a beautiful sight to see. So you have Grandpa, Zaidi, with the streimel and the kaputa, with the langapayas, twirly, and then his son, maybe a little bit more modern, clean shaven. At first you don't realize it's his son, and then you look closer and you see, oh, I see it in the, in the eyes, I see it in the mannerisms. Of course, that must be his son. A generation later, the grandson, you start to look and be like, wait a minute, he doesn't look like either of them. Where'd the earrings come from? With the, the spiked hair, the tattoos, what, what's going on over here? He doesn't look like anybody, but if you look closer, you see, oh, that's, that's the grandson. What a wonderful sight to see generations come together at the Seder table. But there's a deeper story here that we have to get into. How is it that in a few generations, we go from the rabbi of the year to People Magazine's coolest man of the year? How do we get there in a few generations? The point of Seder night is much deeper than we realize. Imagine the first Seder night. Jews were in Egypt dealing with the, the struggles of Galut Mitzrayim, Paro, and the wicked people, and all of the things they were going through. That night was very meaningful and special to them because that was their life. That was on the front page and every page of their newspaper that day. And imagine the next Pesach. In the desert, they celebrated another Pesach. Again, Jewish people with Hashem surrounding them every second, celebrating their redemption from Egypt. That was also very special and very current. And everybody participated and everybody had what to appreciate in that Pesach Seder. Thousands of years later, how do we keep that fire alive? So unfortunately, when the heart and soul of the Pesach Seder and the Pesach experience dwindles, so we see this transformation from Rabbi Friedman to John Fried or John whatever. And that's what I want to speak about. The rabbis tell us, and we even read it in the Haggadah, that Chayev Adam Lirot et Atzmo Ki'ilu Hu Yatsami Mitzrayim. A person is obligated to see it as if he himself went out of Egypt. Now that's interesting. Imagine, the halacha says that you have to see yourself as if you went out of Egypt. You know, I would respond, or someone might respond, don't tell me what to do. But they're not, they're not telling you, you better do this or else. I think there's something deeper here. What they're saying is, if you want the Pesach experience to work to the fullest, then you need to see it as if you yourself came out of Egypt. You have to put yourself in the living experience of the Pesach Seder. Otherwise, it becomes just a, a body without a soul. It becomes things to do. When should I stand? When should I sit? When should I bend? When do, when do I get up to, to leave and make my phone call and figure out what I'm really doing tonight for fun? When the Seder night is not fun and it's not part of you, then something is missing and you see the generations dwindle. So the idea here and the wonderful advice that the rabbis are giving us is to see you as if you yourself are going out of Egypt is to realize how to make that story, the Pesach story, a story relevant to you now and relevant for, to you tomorrow. If it becomes a story about you that's relevant, then, then it, everything changes meaning. So how do we do that? How do we make the story relevant to me? So we think that Mitzrayim and the concept of going out of Mitzrayim is something that happened once a long upon a time ago. That's not so. Going out of Egypt is something that has to happen right now. Let me tell you, most kids today grow up, they don't realize, they're in Egypt. They're in Egypt. Egypt is happening right now. We, the Jewish people, are in Egypt. Most people will say, well, what do you mean we're in Egypt? I'm very happy where I am. That's, and that's part of the problem. You go to LA, New York, that's really Mitzrayim. France, England, that's another Mitzrayim. Jewish people, when they're not where they belong, when they're not in their home, that's Mitzrayim. And 
the people have to realize that, that where they are is not their home. You know, there's an interesting idea that the rabbis tell us about actual, actual going out of Egypt. You might think that Hashem came to save the day and all the Jews were saved and all the Jews left and went to the, you know, lived happily ever after, but that's not so. Do you know that only one-fifth of the Jews in Egypt actually left Egypt? Four-fifths, most of the Jews didn't even make it out. They ended up, fortunately, dying in Egypt. And the, the question is, how come? If Hashem came and saved the day, why didn't all of the Jews leave Egypt? You might think, well, maybe those four-fifths were very terrible and they didn't deserve to leave, but that's also not so. Because they were all, all the Jews at that time were guilty of, of sins. The, the angels in heaven accused those that did leave at Kriyat Yamsu for the splitting of the sea and said, how come you're going to save them? They were worshipping idols. So even the one-fifth that left Egypt were guilty of worshipping idols. So why did they, what was so special about them that they got to leave and the other, fa- other four-fifths didn't get to leave? What was so special? So the sad answer is simple. <laughs> they didn't want to leave. That one-fifth said, we want to leave. And they got up and they left in haste, trusting in Hashem and running into a desert. The other four-fifths didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave, so they didn't. They had excuses, reasons, all different ideas. Now, you hear such a story and you say, how could it be that four-fifths didn't follow Hashem into the desert? How could that be? Well, let me ask you, how different are we today? How different are we today? Imagine Mashiach is finally here. Unbelievable news. He knocks on a door, beautiful mansion with a couple of cars. Open the door, how you doing? Uh, who are you? I'm Mashiach. Great, we've been waiting for you for thousands of years. What, uh, what can I do for you, Mashiach? He says, well, it's time to leave. It's time to go back to Israel. It's time for the redemption. It's time to go out of the Mitzrayim that we're all in today. So you think for a minute, and be like, that's unbelievable news, but... Uh, this is the problem. I'm a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm, my house is for sale right now and I'm in the middle of negotiating the deal and it's, uh, it's very important. It's a lot of money that I'm about to make and uh, also there's a few business deals that I'm in the middle of and not, let's not forget my son. It's, it's the middle of football season. You know, he's so excited. He's, he's finally getting the hang of, you know, how it goes. He's, he's the quarterback, you know. So it's possible, Mashiach, maybe you could come back in about maybe, maybe six months, a year. I'm sure by then I'll be ready to leave. Now, Maybe we won't all answer that way. That might be an exaggeration. But let's ask ourselves, how many of us are really ready to up and leave? How many of us are ready to leave the Mitzrayim that we're in? So that's really what I think is the, the heart of the problem is that we're detached from who and what we really are. And therefore, we see that generation after generation, the Seder night becomes less meaningful. And the solution to this problem is to become reattached to who and what we really are. There's a heart and soul to the Seder night, and there's a heart and soul to each one of us. And when they connect, then the magic is back. I'll explain. The Jewish people in Egypt, those that merited to leave, kept three unique things about them. And it was in the merit, or partially in the merit, of those three things that they actually got out. We're taught that they didn't change their name, they didn't change their dress, and they didn't change their language. Now, when you picture it, so you can imagine, a Jew that walked around in Egypt was distinctly and overtly Jewish. I could tell. He's from B'nai Israel and he's not. But that's just one level of the story. That's a simple idea. And of course, we know that we can remain Jewish externally, but that's only one level. What does it really mean to keep our names and our dress and our language? So. Let's start with a Jewish name. How many people today have detached themselves from the real Jewish identity that is their heritage? And how many people would rather walk around, you know, with heritage of someone else? You know, it's funny, you know, being involved in Kiruv, people walk by, and you can't help but judge what you see. So when you, when you think for sure that guy's not Jewish, he surprises you and walks by and says, Hey, Rabbi, Shabbat Shalom. Oh, how are you? Come here. What beautiful earrings you have. I'm glad you decided to be symmetrical with two. Some people go with one. You went with two. So, it's funny. The external tells also a story. When you are connected with the real Jewish identity that's been passed down from generation to generation, then you're connected. And it goes very deep. When 
things that are Jewish can make you excited, you're happy about them, you're interested in them. When there's no interest in the book that God wrote, but there's interest in Facebook and Google and everything else, and all the nonsense, every movie that's made up, so where is your heart? Where is your soul? Let's talk about language. What does it mean not to change your language? What is the language of, of a Jew? Well, when Hashem spoke to the Jewish people, they understood God's language. God spoke to us, and we perceived that, we understood that, and that became the guidelines and the direction that we lived our life by. The Torah is a living Torah. The word Torah itself means instruction. There's a heart and soul in the Torah as well. How many of us have connected with that heart and soul in the Torah? The Torah is a story of old stories about old people that means nothing to me today, but that's far from the truth. The Torah is a living Torah. The Torah is Hashem talking to you. And Hashem knows in every generation what message we need to receive. And if you look into the Torah, the language, the language of the Torah, the Jewish language, if you keep your language, you'll understand that message from Hashem. Hashem is constantly talking to us. We have to open our ears and our eyes and our hearts and see and feel and understand what Hashem is telling us. And if we can do that, then we might get on the track. What's the third thing? The dress. What does it mean to have a, a Jewish dress? Does that mean to go find a Jewish designer that's on the, that's clothing is in GQ magazine and then we call it Jewish? You know, Sarbatani Jarbiani, Jewish. What's a Jewish dress? We have to understand that the life and purpose of, of a person, of all people ultimately, is not to go for the external materialism, superficial pleasure that comes and goes. We all have a soul. All people have a soul, especially we've been given a job to light up the world and to light up people's souls. If we go for the external, the dress, the, the simple, nice, cute outfit in life, then we're missing out on the real life. Uniqueness and beauty is not what's, what you show outside. The real beauty of a person is within. The real uniqueness of each of us is to express our ideas and our feelings and ultimately our soul. So ultimately, if we can connect to these three things properly, if we can get back our Jewish identity, the name, Yitzchak, Avraham, Moshe, you know, are we, are we American first and Jewish on Sunday afternoon when we got to go to a class? Or are we proud that we are descendants of holy, holy people that stood the test of time and we're still here, but are we really here or are we sleeping? If we can get back our clothing, the old-fashioned clothing, which is really the essence of who we are inside, the pinimiyut. Not to go for the external, but to let that external be an expression of the internal, that our souls should speak through our actions and what we do, and we shouldn't fall for the quick fix of the pleasure and materialism and, and the excitement of uh, the bright lights. And of course, last of all, the language. Hashem's language, the language of Torah, the language of the Jewish people, to understand and be in line in that direction following Hashem to that finish line. The Seder night is an eternal relay race, starting from the days of Egypt, the real days of Egypt, and it's continuing. And it's our job to continue the next lap and till the final lap. 